companies taking uh, stock of ESG, uh, and many governments announced roadmaps and strategies for hydrogen. Uh, but of course, those need to be funded. Uh, I think the IAA in their net zero uh, pathway um, suggests a $1.2 trillion uh, uh, funding to meet the net zero for hydrogen. These are accumulated investments. Um, I think Goldman Sachs has that price tag at $5 trillion. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of opportunities to, to invest, but also uh, a lot of risk. So uh, to help us get to the bottom of this, um, we have esteemed panelists uh, joining us today. Um, first, on my left, we have John Ballantyne, who is a senior lecturer in Brandeis International School of Business, where he also served as a director uh, of the Masters of Science in Finance program for 15 years. Uh, he's a specialist in energy and climate change, corporate finance, uh, and published many articles on labor economics, the banking industry, uh, uh, and uh, in politics and hydrogen. Um, and outside of academia, he also worked as a, b a banker, uh, a CFO for a, a software startup, um, and a consultant with Arthur, Arthur D. Little. And I know you were here as a, as a, as a visiting researcher at Capstark as well. Uh, to his left, uh, we have uh, Alexander Hoogstein, I hope that is correct, in KU Leuven, uh, where he is uh, pursuing his PhD in mechanical engineering at the uh, Energy System uh, Integration and Modeling Research Group. There he is investigating uh, the role of hydrogen in industrial decarbonization and the impact of hydrogen policy on energy markets. Um, Next to him is Abdullah Shangiti, uh, who is uh, native, um, uh, native to Saudi Arabia, uh, but joins us from Columbia University uh, in New York from the engineering department, where he's uh, getting a degree in material science and engineering with a specific focus on uh, sustainable energy solution. And uh, you, you worked in multiple institutions, including King Abdul Aziz City of uh, Science and Technology. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have Martin Willem, uh, who holds a Master's of Science in Economics from Cologne University, uh, and is the founding manager of Geopolis uh, Energy Partners. And he's a strategic advisor to corporation, financial institution, investors, and uh, policymakers in risk management and global energy markets. So uh, welcome all. Um, just to start the discussion, uh, I'd like to throw a general question out there uh, when it comes to hydrogen. When it comes to hydrogen, we see a lot of views of, on, on the extent or the role of hydrogen plays in decarbonization. So from your point of view, I want to know what is the hydrogen economy in your view and what are the investments or opportunities and risks uh, going forward? Okay, uh, thank you very much. And those in the back, if you were in my classroom, I'd call you forward. Um, but let me just uh, start with a less rosy scenario because I think Adam sort of outlined that is that the amount of money that's needed to make this transition is significant in trillions of dollars. Hydrogen is one part of that and doing this it, of all of the above, which is really part of the, the solutions that we've been talking about is not gonna be easy. So if we have this huge gap in financing and funding and forgetting whether you can make money, because that's clearly an important part of this. How are we going to do it, particularly if the challenges are much more immediate than we want to accept and think about? If the climate change issues are really start hitting us hard in the next five years, there's going to be, at some point, a, a reaction to saying we've got to do something faster, and how do we accelerate this when there's so much uncertainty. And I think that's really the challenge that we're looking at. And if you look at hydrogen, hydrogen is, you know, it's come out of the, it's, it's, in, it's in the project feasibility um, part, and there's a lot of, you know, sort of uncertainty on what's possible, whether those, you know, cost curves and learning curves are gonna come down. So as you step back and say, okay, let's look at the less rosy scenario, and the world's not so pleasant, and there's a lot of conflict, and people aren't happy. And that's, and that's not hard to see. We've kind of been going through that. How do you come up with different frameworks to make something happen? And the only way in the past 100 years that we've had the Marshall Plan after World War II was a time that we did that. And you did this in the, in the Great Depression, saying we've really got to restart and redo things differently. So that's the less rosy scenario. And I think a lot of us don't want to kind of think about that world, but that's clearly really possible. And the world order is not easy. And so 
to make hydrogen work and to make to accelerate it and again you can look at the space race and when people said how do we accelerate technology you need investment and you need investment that's supported and you need something that and obviously you're not going to have power purchase agreements on hydrogen when you don't know what the price is because you don't know what the cost is and so the whole bunch set of issues that are preliminary and so therefore you're going to need coordinated government actions of a lot of money because needless to say banks and financial institutions are not going to put in you know two three four trillion dollars if they don't know there's some sense that they're going to get the money back and at this point as you look at the numbers, to the extent that there are numbers, you're saying, ah, it doesn't quite work. Oh, gee, I don't think I can get, get the, um, our grid to be green that quickly. And that becomes the challenge that we're having. It's not that hydrogen doesn't have a possibility. We all know the energy content of hydrogen and turning it into ammonia is really compelling and that it can really work in terms of you know, transportation and shipping and heavy transport and things like that but you need to get a scale. You can't just do it on a project feasibility basis. And I think one of the issues that is not really Adam in his very you know, understated way, these are huge issues. And I think we sense that. The rest of the world does not really get that. And we get caught in one agenda rather than all of the above. And we know that things get politicized. And we're still trying to say, how do we make this happen? Aramco, what they're doing, and the reason I got interested in Aram in hydrogen was because four years ago or three and a half years ago before COVID, Aramco was saying, we're doing this, we're making these investments there. And I said, wow, this is fascinating. What's happening there? But then how do you take that from a feasibility standpoint, building plants and then getting the financing? And you can't just do it all privately. And, you, and the public debt's going to be hard to do it. You're going to have to say governments across the world are going to say, this is one part of many solutions. And we're not there. And we are still struggling to get out of COVID. And if you look at the challenges in financing in Europe, post-COVID, they're huge. And so, and so this is, I, I think, this, the urgency of these issues are, are being understated. I think we, as an organization, have started to get that. Um, the energy companies are clearly, there's been a change in the past three, four years, saying this is real. And we are going to try to figure out how to do the climate change, but I'm afraid, and I think this is a disturbing thing, and Bob McNally talked about this, it's going to be, could be very disruptive and not, not easy. That's not what we want. We do not want a, a, a price run up and a crash and then climate change gets bad and whoa, you say, how are we doing it? But to make something happen in an early startup stage, you need money, you need scale, and you need to know that you're going to make mistakes, and, and, and those mistakes are going to be costly. And that is the part where I think in terms of people in the finance firm's consciousness and what you know, Bob Smith was saying, we don't have it there. And so we're going to have to come up with new frameworks and new institutions to have this happen. I don't see that conversation happening yet. Maybe it will. I'm afraid that it's going to take a much, couple more pretty big bumps to scare people. Um, so yes, it's got a lot of possibility and potential. Ten years is not what we want. We've got to figure out how do we sort of move it faster. And that's going to take some kind of government, corporation, not-for-profit actions. And, you know, so that's, I think, where we're at. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop for the moment. <laughs> yeah, so Alex, do you have to share the same sentiment? Uh, I mean, the yeah, I would, I would share that sentiment indeed. Uh, investments will need to happen, you know, in tremendous amounts if you want to reach, you know, targets that, you know, are being put forward at the moment. Uh, so I can maybe give a bit of a European perspective. Uh, in Europe, there's a clear intention to accelerate this uptake of hydrogen in the coming years. We can use this carbon neutral hydrogen to decarbonize a lot of industrial processes to start with, such as fertilizer production. Ste the steel industry can use hi hydrogen to decarbonize its process. Uh, but although this, this hydrogen has been mentioned, you know, already in, for years as taking a central role in this, uh, at least in the EU, this uh, ambition has really accelerated in March last year after the tragic geopolitical uh, conflict in, in Ukraine. As a reaction, it launched uh, its Repower EU plan, 
this Repower EU plan announced by the Commission is a comprehensive strategy to divert away from, from Russian gas by 2027. Uh, and in this plan, it lines out an additional need for renewable energy. It increases the target to 69% of end use of electricity to be generated through renewable sources. This is really uh, an astonishing uh, and, um, and overly ambitious, I would say, uh, targets. It's, uh, we are way off track to, to reach that target, and it's a magnitude higher than the previous target, which was 40%. Also in this, in this package, uh, hydrogen comes into the picture as an, another substitute for Russian gas. And of course, since this hydrogen market today is completely lacking, the, the Commission was also proposing different ways to support this, this introduction of this new technology to, to the markets. So it's betting kind of on three ways mm -hmm. of how it would um, yeah, break this chicken and egg problem uh, that exists because there is n not really a big offtake of hydrogen already and there is no renewable production of it uh, yet. So one way through which it would uh, accelerate this uh, deployment would be through a mechanism they call uh, the Innovation Fund, which is already you know, uh, in place. And it's really lump sum um, subsidies giving to projects that you know, are investing into, into these this, uh, new technologies, which have a completely immature nature and therefore uh, come with a lot of, a lot of risk. Um, a second one would be, in my opinion, a bit of the most outrageous one. It's the one that is called a hydrogen bank. Mm -hmm. The idea there would be that the, the commission would set up an institute itself that would act as the, the off-taker for renewable production of hydrogen uh, at certain price guarantees. And the numbers they are proposing are just outrageous, uh, up to 10 megatons of hydrogen uh, by 2030. Um, knowing that the, the current you know, use of hydrogen is in the same neighborhood uh, as that, the, the, the current production that's being done using uh, natural gas, yeah, it's, it's uh, very questionable how they would finance this and, and where that would, that would lead us. Um, it's kind of an interesting subsidy scheme because what you're in, in a sense are doing is generating so much hydrogen that it would even have a, a downward pressure on prices, which also puts like, um, kind of acts as, a, as, a, as an incentive for off-takers of hydrogen to develop processes that can make use of, of hydrogen. So in that sense, it's a, it's a bit in, uh, of an interesting approach, uh, but to my knowledge, this is uh, unheard of, this kind of, a, of an approach. Uh, so I have my, my questions about it. Obviously, because this is arguably not the most cost-effective approach to, 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 to incentivize this, this hydrogen. It's also completely disconnected from the kind of economic justifications for this subsidization, subsidization which are these learning effects that we want to kick in in the development of these hydrogen production facilities. Uh, but these are related to how much capacity of these electrolyzer that we install and these carbon uh, sequestration uh, facilities. But the learning is not in production of, of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, it's in the, in the rollout of the capacity to, to, to scale up the, the, the production capacity of these technologies. Uh, and then the third mechanism would, in my opinion, be the most interesting one which is really uh, geared towards de-risking. It's called uh, a carbon contract for difference, which is kind of taking the idea that we had with uh, contracts for difference for electricity to give price guarantees for renewable uh, electricity generation and bring that to the story of hydrogen, um, also to support end uses of, of hydrogen, give them a bit more of a stable investment um, environment by giving them this kind of uh, contract for difference, um, but then defined on the carbon price that we have in Europe rather than uh, on the electricity price. Um, so to finish up, uh, these CCDFDs could play really a, an important role in balancing the cost of low carbon hydrogen production and the high carbon um, cost of this, this production. 
Um, yeah, so this can, these kind of de-risking instruments yeah. can really help because they can really mobilize a, yeah. a multitude of, of private investments per tax dollar being, yeah. being spent. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And I think we'll get into the details of, uh, of, of, the, of what the government and the role of government is, uh, is going to do. But thanks for that uh, opening remark. Um, Abdullah, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of the announcements in MENA actually for hydrogen, a lot of the low carbon or clean hydrogen yeah. projects coming up from here as well. Um, how do you see the opportunities is, and, and the risks are for, or for, for these projects in, yeah. in the GCC, yeah, right. but also in the MENA uh, in general? Yeah, so hydrogen is definitely... If you can get your mic... Uh, yeah. It's definitely the next big thing in MENA. If you go to any conference about energy, hydrogen is going to be in the top of the agenda. And on that point, I want to take a point that John mentioned and go from there. You said that it's not going to be enough for a private institution to fund this transition. It's going to be up to governments to put in long-term investments. And that's what we need. We're building an entire value chain from minerals to electrolyzers to fueling hydrogen. Uh, and we've never built something like this uh, in that scale. And companies and the private sector is not going to be able to do that alone. Uh, it's going to need long-term commitments, either from something like the uh, hydrogen bank, something that could guarantee that a market would be found for the hydrogen, or maybe subsidies in the production. Um, there's definitely a lot of solutions that could be thought of. But we definitely need to rethink how we finance hydrogen. It is, we did it before with solar panels uh, over the th past 30 years. And right now, solar panels and solar energy is really cheap. Mm -hmm. So I think if we think long term and start working fast, we can definitely apply what we learned from the solar panel industry into hydrogen. And when it comes to the MENA, uh, we're in the perfect place. Uh, we have a lot of resources be it solar, solar, wind, or gas, and we can use all of them. Um, I think one thing we have to look at is that hydrogen shouldn't have any color. We should move past these colors and look at the emissions. Uh, if you look at green hydrogen, sure, it doesn't require, it doesn't produce any CO2 in the production phase, but what about the mining? What about all the processes that come before that? So I think we will need a lot of certification, a lot of looking at the entire value chain uh, and then pu putting hydrogen as something that is, like ranking it based on emissions instead of the source of energy or the feedstock that made that hydrogen. Um, and I think I'm going to end it here and pass it to you. Right, thanks. Uh, Martin, I'd like to hear your input on what you heard so far and um, I kind of your, your perspective coming from a, um, um, yeah. from a geopolitical uh, uh, mind sense. Yeah, let, let me um, try to take a slightly different perspective so I don't have to repeat you guys. And, and uh, my plan was to contradict everything you said, <laughs> but you're too good for that, so, so I don't want to make a fool of myself. So, um, so if, if I try to take the perspective of a sophisticated investor on all this, um, I'd say the, the first thing I need to realize is um, um, if, if a sophisticated investor really thinks they're sophisticated right now, they're probably not sophisticated. Uh, so in other words, I think the, the world is going through, uh, for some time now, uh, through increasingly severe structural changes that uh, that affect in a hundred different ways uh, investment markets in general and energy specific um, uh, investment even more so and hydrogen investment, potentially private investment even more so. So uh, I think the best thing you can do is try to make some somewhat intelligent guesses what a sophisticated investor might do if they existed. <laughs> Um, so, um, the first thing I would add to uh, the points you made is um, hydrogen markets outside of uh, the very specialty uh, industrial hydrogen niches that have existed for uh, many, many decades, 
don't really exist as what we normally call markets. Um, that's the first point. The second point is um, I, I remember the time when we developed deregulated electricity markets in the US, in Europe, in Scandinavia uh, was actually fir came first. Um, and, um, and that was incredibly challenging and hard and difficult, but that was, we, we didn't have to invent a new, the electricity actually, the product existed, the commodity existed. It was just deregulation and develop, and that was very hard. Someone this morning, I forgot what it was, it mentioned the story uh, from going from, um, from uh, gas trading in the US in the 50s right. to having an actual market in the sense of an right. economics textbook, which took 40 years with gas. I would say both electricity and gas are complex commodities, but they're vastly more trivial than hydrogen, partly because hydrogen is, is not a commodity uh, uh, that you either generate with known technology and, and solid economics that have existed, been solid for a hundred years, um, or a gas that you find in the ground. It's, it's something much more challenging from the generation side. And, and then it's a much more complex commodity to trade, which is important for the investor and in finance. Uh, perspective, of course, because that is eventually where you get your value streams from. And trading hydrogen, eventually the, the whole value, I think, from a strategic and energy economics point of view of hydrogen, eventually lies in, in the many, in the flexibility and the many embedded real options, if you want to call it that way, that uh, hydrogen would allow, if there was a market, between different commodities in the energy space. So it, it would, in a sense, from a microeconomics point of view, it would complete the energy market space in a very significant way. Uh, if, if you just use hydrogen to transport or produce electricity, for instance, you know, produce hydrogen and then use it in a fuel cell, or it, it's ridiculously inefficient. Uh, transporting hydrogen is not that efficient. So, so it, it has many disadvantages, but knowing that we can't do long-term, large-scale electricity storage with batteries, and I think that's, you know, you, you might push it uh, on-grid uh, batteries, large-scale, I think is possible, maybe for a few days at some point in the future, but you can't do seasonal electricity storage with, say, 70, 80% renewables in Europe, for instance, uh, seasonal storage using batteries. That's ridiculous. And we don't have enough hydro storage, even with all the investments the Scandinavians can still do or we can do in the Alps. Uh, so, so hydrogen has to be part of the picture. But developing that as a market, I would say is vastly more challenging than developing traded gas markets. But, and, and, and the last point as an uncertainty, um, you know, we had amazing cost developments in solar in the last 20 years. And nobody, absolutely nobody would have predicted that 20 years ago. But how did that happen? We, we had significant research R&D investments in the US, in Europe to some degree, in Japan, in, uh, Korea, uh, and we, we then had lots of ventures, especially in the US. We, we had massive subsidies mm -hmm. in Germany and a couple other places very early on in the early 90s that ramped up things sort of with brute force. And then the Chinese kicked in with massive sub subsidies on the manufacturing side, killed all the ventures in the US and in Europe, but brought costs down dramatically and, and got the, the, the scale, economies of scale cycle going. Mm -hmm. And so that collaboration, if you want to call it that way, between different continents, including the Chinese in particular, uh, produced that. 
that was possible in the geopolitical environment in the 90s and 2000s. I don't see how that should work with hydrogen these days in the global environment we have and probably will continue to have. So um, there's a lot of risk. And so the key skill for an investor, I think, will be to, um, I, I think what we need to do also is as economists, um, I think that is one of the biggest challenges for energy economists. Uh, we need to do what the French uh, have a saying for that, reculer pour mieux sauter. So it so means pull back to be able to jump better and further. We need to think really hard and, and find new ways to deal with uncertainty that are more that are not similar, we, we, shouldn't, we can't learn from the last 60, 70 years of economics because the world was too stable. Mm -hmm. We need to learn from the 1920s, 30s, fr from times when people were also in the middle of a mess because the economists then, in many ways, were smarter uh, dealing with this type of thing than we are today. So I'll leave yeah. it at that. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to sort of reiterate, as you were talking, one of the things that I was thinking about is that we are going through a paradigm shift, and this is a nonlinear process of change. And those of you who are old enough as I am can remember the transistor radio and the space race, why that happened and why we got the technology invest investments in the U.S., was the comp competition with the Soviet Union to be the first person to the moon. And those kind mm -hmm. of processes are necessary to leapfrog. And, and it's probably not going to happen on a global basis. It's probably going to happen on a regional basis. That people in a are divided gonna, globe. In a divided world. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and so if Europe is going to be stuck on its, its green hydrogen and electrolysis, that may not be a technology that happens right away. There are going to be other things. But we have to kind of get out of the conventional thinking that Keynes challenged in the, in the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And those of you who had to read them, you know, both of his books, his Treatise on Money and everything else, you have to go through that saying this is a challenge that is, you know, maybe not existential, but in many ways is. To make these changes, it's going to take significant readjustments of what we're thinking, and it's just not a nice linear process. Um, and to leapfrog and make that happen. Is, right. I mean, that's what you were yeah. sort of talking about. Yeah. Right. And we, we won't find any mechanisms that will do right. that. Right. So I'm very skeptical <laughs> with all kinds of, you know, let's just de-risk it and then we can use the normal process. It's not going right. to work. And even the moonshot metaphor and, and sort of the, 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 the Sputnik shock and right. all that, those are nice metaphors. Right. What we're, looking at is, is a couple orders more challenging. Agreed. And I'm not sure in this day and age, we, the US or anybody else, would be up to the uh, moonshot challenge even. So. Right. That's right. <laughs> so yeah, you guys give a great overview of yeah. you know, the risks and, and the uncertainties that, uh, that come with, uh, uh, with hydrogen. And, and that's why I want to move it toward, towards, well, you know, if you, if you um, put your investor cap on, um, what role do you want to see from from the government uh, to kind of kickstart this? I mean, we've seen we've seen so many of these hydrogen strategies and roadmaps being announced, um, right? So this is a good starting point. Uh, but um, we started to see like the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act and some uh, regulations uh, being set in stone in Europe, although not yet. Um, but I mean, is that enough, uh, or do we need more than that? Because I believe the IRA, for example, the IRA is. 10 years and you have to guarantee that after 10 years are done that the demand will start picking up by its own um, otherwise you need another flash up more more cash to uh, keep so it going you, so you need flexible policy this is not the way we operate we don't operate you don't try and something you lock in something you say we're going to subsidize or have rems and things like that and they're in place for a long period of time you say maybe we have a subsidy or maybe we have a requirement like a cafe standard or whatever may happen. You're going to, and you know, the cap and trade had a lot more flexibility. The idea of being able to change your targets and things like that. But this is not a simple solution. And so, therefore, governments 
have to have that flexibility and to communicate that to the public, and that is enormously difficult. As, as you know, as, and Europe has gone down the, the green hydrogen route rather than saying, hey, this is a, has a possibility, but how do we make this work? Maybe you set standards, maybe you have subsidies, maybe you have co-investments, but you need that, and that is not the nature of our institutions. I mean, the World Bank has tried that at various times, but it, 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 it's, it's a clumsy process. And we have to accept that this is gonna be a clumsy experimenting process. We're gonna make mistakes, and some things are gonna work, and that's great, but other things are not. And I don't know how you communicate and make that happen to policymakers who want a, you know, you know, five sentence uh, phrase of, you know, this is what I'm doing, and rather than this is complex. We academics loved complexity, but not the rest of the world. Yeah, Alex, I'd like to hear your opinion on that too, because um, I know there was an announcement early this, uh, this year with the, uh, the president of the European Commission, with the Green Deal industrial, um, or industrial plan. Um, is there any details, by the way, of that plan, and, and, how, and what do you think? Is that enough to kick, kind of kickstart the... <laughs> Well, <laughs> is that what, what Europe needs, I guess? To I live in Brussels, so I'm very close to the discussions, but even then, it's very hard to keep track of, of <laughs> where things are going. These things are very, you know, di diverse and ever-changing. You've really seen that change, you know, uh, over, over the last year, that suddenly uh, the EU is willing to act very fast, and it has really completed, completely changed the pace at which they act. Um, and also they're not shying away from very far going state intervention anymore, it seems. Um, thinking about these uh, ambitious targets and about very far going government support in, in being able to reach those targets. However, yeah, I find this very questionable and I rather would see the, the government support to be, to be um, you know, that it would be only partly in, in kind of these de-risking instruments and, and limited to that. Um, it's to kind of allude to the, the economic justifications be behind that. There is incomplete risk markets into these you know, new, te new technologies. Investors into uh, renewable hydrogen, they cannot hedge their risk ag against volatile electricity prices because those risk markets are only you know, at a certain time horizon. And of course, on the other side of the coin, to, to, to sell their hydrogen, there, there is complete uncertainty. So I, would, I wouldn't say the role of a government there is to give uh, price guarantees or, or, or uh, possibilities to, to hedge their, their risk against the future price of, of hydrogen, but they could at least um, aim to, to set up um, markets and try to uh, talk with with uh, the financial industry to try to get some, um, to try to get to these risk markets to be uh, to be developed. Right. Uh, thanks, and uh, Abdullah. I mean, uh, you mentioned that um, you know the GCC is is endowed with all these resources, yeah. um, and that's a good starting point uh, as well. But um, uh, what do you think is need, needed to see from um, you know the, the policymakers here to kind of kickstart this hydrogen economy in, in this region? I think when it comes to an industry that hasn't been built and scaled up to the scale, uh, investors need to see commitment, need to see that if they put in their money, someone will buy the hydrogen they make. And if you look at Neom, that has been the case. In 2020, when the uh, project was announced, at the same time, they, they announced that the entire hydrogen will be sold to Europe. It's gonna be used in transportation. And that could give, give the investor uh, the relaxation that, okay, this amount is gonna be used, someone's gonna buy it, and they, they can put in their money without that much of a risk. Um, we've seen recently a lot of commitments from Saudi Arabia, be it the Saudi Green Initiative, that is happening on an annual basis, from the UAE, who recently announced that it wants to capture 25% of the global hydrogen market, um, and I think we're going to see these things accelerating, and hopefully we'll see um, commitments that are concise to the amount of hydrogen that might be needed, to the type of hydrogen, be it green, be it blue, low carbon. Uh, and only, I think, when this level of transparency and this level of commitment happens, 
um, investors are going to be happy to put in their money. Um, yeah. Yeah. And do, do you see a role, uh, just a follow-up question, uh, do you see a role for, for example, so we've seen the Inflation Reduction Act playing out in the, in the U.S. and possibly in Europe, a similar kind of mechanism. Um, in, in the GCC, it seems like the, 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 the PIF, the public investment funds, or I mean the, in Saudi Arabia, but in general, the sovereign wealth funds are playing a role in, in financing these projects. Uh, do you think that would c continue or you would eventually need more private uh, participation uh, coming in or is it yeah. going to be a bit of both? So it's definitely different from the US where you have a lot of private sector and you need to give them tax deductions and right. for Europe, it's also different. But as you said, in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf in general, it's a lot of government-funded projects. It's a lot of uh, PIF, it's a lot of Adnoc, Aramco, and these companies. And I think it's going to be like this for a while, because right now hydrogen is not cost-effective, it's not efficient, and if we do not put enough money in it to advance it and to push it, the technology, we're not going to reach a stage where it's profitable. So I think for our region at least, until we reach that point of technological advancement, we're going to need a lot of government uh, support. And uh, Martin, you'd like to add something on the, uh, I mean, we'd, it's, it's, I think there's an appreciation of like mixture of the uh, kind of the governance or how everyone's approaching uh, this uh, uh, kind of financed part of the, of the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. of hydrogen. Um, what do you make of all of this? Uh, or does, is there one solution to finance this or is it, I, we have to accept that there's, uh, you know, recognize that, you know, there's different policies in different uh, regions. Right. I, um, I mean, one, one thing that I meant by the pulling back um, to, to better be able to jump faster. Right. So basically go slower to be faster um, uh, is, I think we need to, because we think, and probably for good reasons, that we need to accelerate this whole development um, quite a bit compared to what we thought was necessary two or three years ago. And it, I mean, what we thought, the Europeans at least, two or three years ago uh, was necessary was not lacking in ambition, let's put it mildly. Uh, so. So we, we need to think about uh, accelerating the long-term process and not just the next three years, because the next three years are not going to matter much right. if mm -hmm. the long-term process doesn't. So, so that's my assumption. Um, I would give you two, uh, two examples. One example for what, and, and of course, countries with respect to hydrogen are not at all equal or similar, uh, so different countries and different governments uh, uh, should probably do very different things. Um, I'll give you, for the European and American perspective, I'll give you one example of what I think they need to do, and one example uh, what I think they need to avoid. Uh, what they need to do much more with this longer term perspective is, is get much more serious and much more aggressive about innovation because most of hydrogen, once it becomes investable, will be sort of large-scale infrastructure investment that is good for institutional investors and all kinds of things. But the economics are not fully there, and you cannot solve that problem for 30 years with subsidies for 30 years. Right. So, so we, there, there's some very crucial bottlenecks, uh, particularly with electrolyzers and different material combinations, to uh, improve efficiency, cost, but also the, the selection of um, critical minerals that you use to, uh, to get the best hedge for the geopolitical risks behind that. So th there's a lot of need for a very complex innovation, particularly in material science. So we're, we're basically hoping you will solve the Hopefully. problem. <laughs> um, so, um, what that needs is government funding for innovation. And I can tell you one story. Um, I, I tried, uh, there's an agency in, in the US called ARPA-E. Uh, that is the government innovation agency, basically. They spend 
so far, I think, three, four hundred million years, uh, uh, dollars a year funding uh, about a hundred uh, early stage startups in the energy space for three years with one, one million dollars per year. So that's significant for early stage startups. Um, it's modeled after an agency called DARPA that did that uh, since the early 60s in the defense space. And that was very successful. We wouldn't have the internet, many people say, without them. So um, ARPA-E, I think, is a really good mechanism to boost the space. Of course, you need then a good venture capital ecosystem behind that that picks up from there, which you can argue whether the US even has that. Uh, I tried with the head of ARPA-E uh, in 2014 to convince the German Chancellery and the European Commission to do something similar in Europe. And we failed because there was not the political willingness to, uh, to create a mechanism where you, everybody knew from the outset that um, from some you know, close to half a billion euros a year taxpayer money, 80% will prove to be wasted. They didn't want to do that. If you're that risk averse, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how, it, so doing things like that, I think is absolutely crucial, not for the next three years, it won't make a difference, but for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. What we need to avoid, I think, is uh, things like subsidy races to ramp up green hydrogen production as quickly as we can with subsidies, especially if we know that there's critical minerals behind that, that where the market is dominated 80, 90 percent by China and Russia and maybe a little bit South Africa, because uh, all we do is ramp up prices uh, that people get that we claim, for better or worse, mm -hmm. Are, are strategic competitors or systemic competitors or whatever. That, that is, I, I don't get, how, but that is what we're doing right now. So yeah. that we shouldn't do. Yeah, I, I agree. And that takes me to my next point, which is on the, the social and governance part of the ESG. Um, not just looking at hydrogen production itself, but also going all the way back to uh, the raw materials that we need to, uh, to get to the production targets that we put for ourselves. Because we assume that you know, we put these production targets and we're going to reach those not knowing you know, that we need tons and tons of materials. It, it stretches all the way back to the, the raw materials itself and we need to guarantee that it's there. And so um, I think financial institutions, in my opinion, uh, need to know of this um, so that they can plan you know, the lead times that is required to bring the materials in and then build those projects. And, you know, and so, that's, so that's, I think, is important. So my question in, in that is um, you know, in terms of in inclusivity and, and, and um, uh, kind of including communities, whether it's in the raw materials parts of the hydrogen value chain or in the production plant itself, um, is there social, there has to be some social opportunity there. Can I, can I turn that question around a, a little bit more practically? As I've been thinking about, and I think uh, Bob Metcalf uh, met, mentions this, is how do you develop end markets? And so I've been thinking about, okay, let's say the end markets for hydrogen are marine, heavy transport, forklifts, which need a lot of power, and so therefore we know we're, retracing, we're replacing diesel and everything else. So how do you develop those markets that then the suppliers say, I'm going to deliver a, a fuel source, and not blue or green, but it has a low carbon content. So let's not get caught in which, what type of hydrogen it is, but it's meeting a low carbon content, and I know I've got a market. Well, I say, gee, how do we know that that market's going to be there? Do you do it through sort of cafe type standards that you're going to have a fuel that turn, has uh, that has you know only so much carbon coming out? Which is, it seems like the marine industry is talking about doing that. Would uh, heavy transport do that? So you need some way to develop mm -hmm. the end market mm -hmm. that then the suppliers say, oh, I know I can now invest providing this this fuel, and I, obviously this is right. a policy problem, 
that and it and it may be and you know it may be that the electrolyzers and what we call green is not the right solution. There are other ways of doing it, meeting the targets. But we, if we don't know that we have an end market that is, has to do, go this way, and whether it be, and I, you know, and, and it's maybe, and it, cafe standards have worked. People don't like them. It's a second best solution. We realize that. But nonetheless, maybe that's the way to do it rather than through subsidies or something like that. But the suppliers aren't going to mm -hmm. be innovative if they don't yet know that, mm -hmm. that they can, they, can meet that market, and that, and I don't know how to do that because then I say, "Gee, I got to change my forklift. I got to change. I've got to invest in new engines." I suddenly I look at the whole supply chain to make that happen. It's significant. Mm -hmm. um, so I think mandates. Yeah, there was in some areas. I mean, they they did use mandates. Like they mandated some portion of hydrogen to be used, for example, by a certain date. Uh, just like the RPS. I mean, that, yeah. that worked in the. Yeah, and and US. Mark Jackard argues that way very much. Yeah. Do other types of solutions rather than the, you know, the price of carbon. There are ways that are do it politically that can happen. Mm -hmm. But if you can't transform the markets that you're selling to, then the suppliers aren't going to say, you know, and the people aren't going to finance it because where you're selling it to and mm -hmm. at what price. And yeah. Uh, and and Alex, uh, up to you. Uh, well, is that blue versus green debate still up in Europe or? As uh, I mean, yeah, uh, well, uh, are they uh, because as uh, you know, John mentioned that the. You know, that's the, the, the renewable hydrogen or green hydrogen is more compatible in Europe, and they're fixated. They were fixated on on that for a while. Um, but I mean, as our subsidies will go through to, for example, other colors of hydrogen, or is it you know green to get a full full package? Yeah, it seems to be a very sensitive uh, topic to decide upon which technologies they would include to be certified as renewable. There's different names even, you know, um, going around. They will make a definition on what is renewable hydrogen, what is carbon neutral hydrogen. Like the, the, the term that lawyers use is uh, re renewable fuels of non-biological origin uh, because they will try to encapsulate any other future fuels people might come up with, which are derivatives from, from hydrogen, yeah. say, you know, ammonia yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and also, it, be, it will be very hard to account for the carbon content of, of, these, of the hydrogen in the end that you produce. So even if you have a very solid definition, it will be very hard to, to in a transparent manner, um, yeah, judge what, what the, the carbon content of this, of this uh, hydrogen is. And in the end, I mean, right. it's, it's hydrogen. It shouldn't matter, right? It's, uh, we have a carbon trading system in which we, are, we try to cap already emissions. And if you argue we need hydrogen for a certain sector, then make sure that sector gets the hydrogen most cost effectively, um, because we are already capping uh, the carbon uh, content. So yeah. So yeah, no, it's. I mean, it's. I, I think it's a. It's a strategic question, and I don't think the European Commission looks at it from that particular strategic angle yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the strategic question is quite simply: um, if if you want, if if you think to get to where you want to get, even just for Europe, uh, you need. A rapid, as rapid as possible, development of a fairly large, geographically comprehensive market for hydrogen. Then, and you acknowledge the fact that hydrogen, by nature, is a more fragmented commodity than natural gas, for instance, right. or oil. Um, then, I think it's common sense to avoid adding unnecessary fragmentation because you're going to slow down the market that right. you want to accelerate. So, uh, but, but they don't seem to think that way. Mm -hmm. Another way to look at it, of course, is um, you know, m maybe a really cold winter can change all kinds of colors. I mean, it does that in nature, right. so why not in hydrogen? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Abdullah, I want to uh, come back to you. I know Saudi Arabia, obviously, with the circular carbon economy, they, yeah. they focus on the emissions. They don't really care where um, the, the, the resource or the source of the hydrogen is. Um, but in, in terms of uh, investments, you know, there's uh, um, this debate, or you can say, not debate, but opinions on, you know, we should start local, develop the local supply chains, hubs, 
valleys, um, and then think about the export market. Whereas uh, in this region, it's um, almost doing the opposite, where they're actually looking at the export market uh, first. But then uh, my question is, it doesn't matter. Does it matter, or is it as long as you have investment in one, like it could it happen in series? Does it have to happen in series, I mean, or could it happen in parallel instead? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think? I think we should do it all at the same time. We saw that uh, the region has exported hydrogen to South Korea, to, <clears throat> to Japan, but at the same time we're developing local markets and local uses for hydrogen. Each use case and each, whether we go, uh, we export or we use it uh, in the Gulf, we will find more problems and we will learn as we go. So it's really important that we do it at the same time and as quick as possible. Uh, I want to add to the idea of colors and hydrogen. I think maybe I'm a little bit biased because I'm, I come from this region, but I think that we need to move away from colors as soon as possible. What matters is CO2 emissions, and if we can uh, certificate that, and if we can like rank uh, hydrogen uh, based on CO2 instead of the origin feedstock, be it gas, be it water, um, we, we should definitely do that. That's going to require a lot of effort because we're going to have to look at the entire value chain from mining to production to recycling. Yeah, where do you stop and where do you start? And where exactly. Do you the system right. boundaries. Right. It's yeah, a big right. system. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to do it. Yep. Yep. Um, I want to open the floor for um, questions from the audience if there's any. Um, I'm not sure if there's the QR code here or there's mics going around. I, th I think there are mics going around, but. Uh, if uh, there's any questions from the audience. I think we have a question over there. Thank you. Uh, f um, the topic of hydrogen is always... Uh, 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 just to speak a little bit louder. If Thank you. Uh, the topic of hydrogen is always the... Uh, the topic of a lot of discussions because it is uh, still in the growth uh, stage. And um, the same point I just re-emphasized in the session number one about hydrogen. Uh, we, should, we should take care of uh, the time required for any technology to be matured. I just used the example of uh, solar panels in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, if you come to any investor and ask him to put his money uh, on a manufacturing facility for uh, PV panels. <laughs> the same exactly response that we receive from uh, investors uh, to invest in a, a factory to produce high efficiency electrolyzers. Uh, for that reason, we have to uh, give the time that was about 30, 40 years back. We do not hope it will stay for that long. Uh, with, the, with the current uh, advancement in technology and, and business, and in financing, uh, probably this time will be shortened, but we should allow for uh, overlapping between existing business as usual and the future uh, energy technologies. This overlap might take 20, 30 years, we don't know, but, but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, market share, fight over market share between different technology mm -hmm. will be the predominant uh, business line, rather than thinking of a technology that will whip out uh, other technologies. Uh, I agree with the uh, emission-free fuel, and this should be the ultimate goal. Uh, and the technologies, we should, uh, the room is, is uh, uh, big enough for, for all type of technology that will help uh, countries to develop mm -hmm. and to secure uh, power generation uh, by whatever mean. But at least we focus on a clean uh, energy future with uh, minimum or zero uh, emission. I'd like just in this contents and on the, on the development cycle, copying the PV uh, investment cycle, how the panelists uh, look at it with respect to the uh, hydrogen cycle. Thank you. So I think wind is a tremendous example of what's happened in the past 10 years and talking about an allocation of resources. So we should have fewer students going into finance, more into engineering. And if you look at what happened in terms of productivity improvements in wind in particular, more so than, in, than solar, it's just phenomenal. And it's because 
if you look at, what, and I'm familiar with what was going on at MIT, it's fantastic in developing different materials, different strengths. And so we can take our human capital, reallocate it, and what's really exciting as you listen to all these webinars, it's half engineers and half economists, and that's the way it should be. It should be more engineers trying to problem solve, working with Aramco, working with all the companies and institutions around the world saying, how do we figure this out? Because you can accelerate it. It's not going to be Moore's law because this is physical. But nonetheless, you can make huge advances if you mm -hmm. take the the effort and, and not just sit around and say, oh, let's see if it happens. And that's really happened in, in particular in wind. Wind is just phenomenal what's happened. And you know, now we're going to be able to have wind going into the grid soon. And now you have to figure out how to store it. <laughs> Anyone wants to add to that? Yeah, I can maybe add to that. Um, there was this one interesting paper uh, in Nature which did this kind of comparison about the rollout that we've seen in, in PV panels and also development in off offshore wind. And it's the, let's say, the, the trajectory that uh, we've seen of, of these technologies has just been uh, amazing. But still, if you compare it to the numbers uh, that are being proposed uh, of you know, speed you want to introduce this hydrogen, it's just completely uh, yeah, still in a, in a different atmosphere, uh, stratosphere. Uh, even if you com they also compared it to the rollout of flight during World War II of the de development of, of planes. And even if you compare it to that, the, the kind of speed up of the technology that we need is, is not in the same order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, so that shows that even in the most you know, pressing times, such as a World War, that we weren't able to, to introduce this technology at year-over-year year growth rates of over 100%. But these are exactly the numbers that you often see proposed in, in these kind of policies right. that make statements uh, about the rollout of these, these technologies. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. And, and, and uh, I, I guess there's also like a, a need for building this innovation hub uh, around this hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Neom is working on, on, on that. So are you if I can maybe end on a more positive note, um, I think those, the two technologies, the more conventional ways of producing hydrogen can go hand in hand with the rollout of these mm -hmm. electric ways. These electric electro, uh, electrolyzers, they're fully dispatchable. They can be operated whenever you know, there is an oversupply of renewables, so they can go hand in hand. They can arbitrage on the, on the price of the hydrogen that probably will be set through uh, SMR-based production. Uh, when, of course, when I'm talking about uh, domestic production, for example, uh, in Europe. Um, no, no, get, getting uh, to these fully uh, flexible electrolyzers that would be the economist's dream, uh, there's a huge amount of technology innovation that still needs to happen. Right. We, we don't have these. Uh, and you, don't, you, you want to maximize flexibility and efficiency, which is not the same thing, they're trade-offs, and uh, I mean, you, you know that much better than we all do. <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to add that, I, so I agree with you all in terms of we need to push for economies of scale, and that like we did with solar, like we, we did with wind, that's how we're going to learn and that's how we will know what the problems are. But I don't think that we have enough time. If you look at all the models that COP is doing, all the countries are doing, we need to be scaling up by 2025, by 2030. Uh, and we don't have enough time from here to that time to learn and to, I guess, to have the same cycle that we did with PV. So I think that we need to be a little bit more aggressive with technology. Some of the technology we need is already, like it already exists in labs. It just needs to be scaled up into uh, something bigger. So I think we need, more aggressiveness when it comes to scaling up technologies so that we can take less time to reach to a hydrogen economy. Great, thanks. Um, any more questions from the, from the crowd? Oh, there's a question over there.
Hi. Uh, we speak about investment in, uh, in energy, but the level in uh, development in energy in uh, developing country so much far from developing country. So how can dev uh, and th more developing country cannot share in the knowledge with developing country? How we can solution this problem? Um, so how, so uh, it's a good question um, uh, about the, develop the, the investments in developing countries and how they are different than the, develop uh, the investments in developed countries. Um, what we're seeing now, of course, is a lot of uh, the export plans, for example, from the developing countries like Namibia, like uh, Egypt, like other countries in MENA. Uh, a lot of investors are coming in, but how do we ensure that it's a win-win situation? and uh, that both countries are getting, including knowledge transfer, technology transfer, things like that, and, and the capacity, the human capital build out as well. Um, any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say there is a, a huge opportunity uh, for developing countries. Some people call it uh, the, second uh, the second round of the commodity um, lottery. Mm. We have, have you know, had this, this um, allocation of, of you know natural resources happening thousands of years ago and now again now again with this introduction of renewable hydrogen there is a second round on the, um, on this there is a complete different set of countries which are now fortunate that they have uh, plenty of wind and solar resources and hydrogen would allow them to export this this energy in, in other forms um, so that would be yeah. my view on that I think, go ahead. <laughs> I think that, that is one part of the answer, and I, I would say the, maybe the more traditional part of the answer. The non-traditional part that I think is, is, is challenging, but I think not unrealistic, is this. Um, there's a lot of countries that you, would, you, you might call emerging or developing countries uh, where if you look at the universities and the education levels and the number of um, people under 35 who have uh, studied, done advanced degrees in the US, in the UK, in, other, in, in parts of Asia uh, with top universities. Um, so you, you have uh, a capability to do your own indigenous innovation that starts from a totally different um, environment. And, and if, if I, especially when talking about renewable energy and hydrogen potentially as well, if, if you start from the energy system environment that you have in, in um, India or in um, parts of um, Africa, you have opportunities that you need to approach in a completely different way than an American uh, research group or early stage venture would, but they, they can actually give you a different path to eventually even being able to compete with these guys from the Western world. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is the complement to what you said. And personally, I would try to push that as hard as I can. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think yeah, it's I, an I, opportunity I, for these countries, but also for the rest of us. And Isn't clearly, f from a point of view, if you take Sub-Saharan Africa, clearly you're not going to be replicating the infrastructure that you've got in Europe or, no. or China or other places. You you're going to do a non-distributed solar grid, and you're going to have to say, to what extent is trans where's the transportation going to be, and what's the transportation network? And then, as, as your question what wasn't really asked, but it's clear, where's the money? And uh, the, the money has got to come from the, the wealthier nations. And it, right. at, at this point, it's not. So okay. it's, it's what development economists call leapfrogging, right? Mm -hmm. We did it with a cell phone. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think in the beginning, it's going to be, so hydrogen is an expensive commodity. And in the beginning, it's going to be in the Europe and the US and Gulf countries. But with time and as we scale up the technology, there will be some spillover effect that will decrease the cost. And hopefully we'll see it in Africa and maybe in Southwest Asia. We've seen that before with 
solar and renewables. We've seen that with gas. So it, it can definitely happen with hydrogen. All right. So we have a question over there. Um, hello, my name is Paweł Brusillo, uh, University of California, San Diego, and Wrocław University of Economic and Business. Thank you very much for a very in in insightful and thoughts and presentation. I have a question about the role of green hydrogen in transportation, because apparently in many regions the green hydrogen is uh, primarily used uh, mm, in, uh, in transportation to decarbonize, uh, especially uh, transit bus fleets, but also light duty segments. So we, we can assume at the moment that the full decarbonization of the transportation sector must be uh, conducted with at least some partial um, incorporation of green hydrogen. So my question is, what in your opinion is the most effective way to achieve sustainable and low cost supply of hydrogen? Not only production, but the supply to the end user. So uh, just to understand the question, you talk about the cheapest uh, production pathway the supply, so to the end user, that someone in Germany go on a station and is expecting the same price around 9 euros, not like in California that the price increased from $15 per kilogram from August last year to $25 uh, per, per kilogram. So how to effectively achieve the sustainable, so low carbon emission supply of hydrogen um, at l lower costs, how to finance such investments and, and achieve this goal? So, um, so I guess I'll, I'll rephrase your, your question as being a, a low carbon hydrogen, not a green. And so then you say, who's going to win and supply that? Well, clearly there, there are a couple regions, um, here being one of them, where you've got abundant energy, both in oil and gas, sun and wind, and you also have that in the Midwest, in the United States, and so then you, and then you, and you know, Germany still has some clouds, so that's, it has, it has an issue there. Less so, less. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so this is a regional market in many ways of looking at who are the low cost producers around the world, and then how does that happen with those markets? Because it's not, it's not gonna be easily global to transport. I mean, you have to change the whole transportation network. But gee, if you've got pipelines and pipelines can work and you've got local, you can, you can serve large markets in certain areas. And I think that becomes the, the issue as investors as being regional markets that are slowly uh, uh, growing over time. And then eventually we find a way to deal with the transportation. But it, it, to me, it's the United States is already doing it, and obviously they're investing in carbon capture and finally starting to do that. It's happening in other parts of the world. It's clearly happening here. And then we get a low carbon fuel that then can, then can be used and maybe exported. And I, Europe's got a different, a different sort of set of challenges. <laughs> yeah, but Italy, Italy is not that far away from the MENA region. Right, you know? that's true. That's I mean, true. Yeah, right. they got pipelines, so. <laughs> yeah, no, Italy's got sun. Yeah. <laughs> And right. food. <laughs> um, any more questions? No? Well, I'm um, going to turn it over and maybe have some closing remarks um, for the panelists. If you want to share something um, from you know, how the, the future is going to, to look like when it comes to hydrogen and the investments in hydrogen. Um, and then we'll just close the session after that. Well, I think we are. Takeaways, basically. Of I think we're sort of brainstorming possibilities, and this is an early stage investment which requires a lot of money. And is as one brainstorms and thinks about things, it's going to take innovation, it's going to take labs, it's going to take investments, and there's clearly already been a commitment here to do it, and it's happening in other places because climate change is being taken seriously, and then, hopefully, and I think one of the issues that concerns me is the communication process outside of ourselves. How does the rest of the world understand it? And how do we communicate possibilities? And I think the 
IEA forum tries to simplify things, but people don't really know what hydrogen's about, and then it mostly you get a short article in the Financial Times, and that has not explained what's going on. And if this, if, if, if you're going to get go beyond the buzz, you're going to have to find a way to both get the innovation in probably regional areas doing that, and then find ways to communicate and build these cooperative arrangements among different institutions that care about this. And, and, and that's not simple, but it can be done. <laughs> Alex? Yeah, I want to close by saying um, that I'm very happy to see that finally after so many years of talking about this hydrogen and how this would solve all our problems, that, we're, um, that we can actually see, that I can actually see my inbox, uh, e uh, you know, emails coming in of, of projects being, uh, being realized and on a, you know, on a gigawatt scale, really investments are starting to, to get place, uh, to take place. Um, so that's very interesting to see. So we're transitioning in the, into this period when, uh, you know, things are finally starting to happen. And, but of course, we shouldn't shy away from still this, this problem that this, this immature technology has and, mm -hmm. and try to tackle that and st start to, to mobilize private investments into these uh, novel technologies to try to get us where we want to, want to be. Great. Thanks, uh, Abdullah. Uh, yeah, I think it's the same thing for me. I'm glad to see all, like, all the hydrogen going out, going from only hype to real projects that are being built and that are being scaled up. Uh, eventually, it's all going to come down to technology. And technology, innovation, and research. And that's where I want to see a lot of money being directed to that direction. Because if we solve the problems with technology, with minerals, with materials, we're going to be able to scale hydrogen up really easy mm -hmm. with good costs and good uh, economics. Um, and yeah, th that's where I like, want to see the future of hydrogen investment to go. Great. Martin, final words, yours. Um, I, I assume s some of us might be economists, uh, so, so I might add two things that um, I see as particularly, as things that economists can actually do uh, to, to help this process. Uh, one is um, what I briefly mentioned earlier. We need to, economists need to get dramatically more innovative in, in the way they do economics mm -hmm. than we have been probably for uh, at least the last 30, 40 years, maybe longer. Um, and um, we, we need to break out of the, the normal kinds of models and tools and, and uh, policy mm -hmm. recommendations and frameworks that we've been used to in the last 30, 40 years. We need to break out of that and, and find new solutions because I don't think the types of things we've done in the last several decades, uh, they, they, they were probably quite appropriate and good for all kinds of challenges we had then. I don't believe they will be sufficient for what we're dealing with here. Uh, so that is one thing, and the, uh, you, know, you could give a whole dinner talk uh, about what that means. I'm, I'm not going to uh, bore you with that. But uh, the second thing is realism, and that so realism. Re realism. Yeah. We we need to uh, because another thing that I think we've sort of slipped into, not just economists, policymakers, uh, the, each of us, you know. The, the, Western societies, at least, th those are the ones I can speak for. The, the, um, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but um, w we've slipped into um, more and more sort of narrative-focused debates and thinking. So where, where we have a narrative, and if enough people repeat it often enough, it sounds plausible, right. and then uh, people start being afraid breaking out of the narrative. So realism, um, really dealing with thinking about what is the reality there, independent of what I used to say or what other people say, and struggling with that is another challenge that I think economists would 
pl have to play a significant role, but they're not the only ones, like I said. So. Oh, great. Uh, can I add one other point to what you're saying? As, as and my friend Joe Stanislaw sort of talks about value-based economics. We, as you know, have moved very far to the, whatever corner you want to say, is being finance and money and net present value. Yeah. That's a very limited metric of how do we think about the world and the problems, and how, to, and at least we, you know, right. Nordhaus has sort of said, at least we can throw in the cost of carbon and think about externalities and Ronald Coase and all those stuff. We've got to that start That framework thinking. doesn't cut it either. No, it is I not think. enough. We've yeah, got to come but, up but with new frameworks to do that and to, yeah. to count differently so that we can make decisions longer term and right. unfortunately, the venture capital world in the United States does not think long term, and we've got these are long term issues yeah. that require much more innovative sort of thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think U.S. venture capital is up to this. No, challenge. absolutely not. Uh, and they they they've learned that once in the the pre uh, the the first decade of this right. millennium, right. but right. Uh, yes. they might learn it again. So. No, right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your inputs. Uh, this has really been a great discussion. You guys made my life uh, easy uh, with, with uh, all the questions you posed yourself as well. Uh, and of course, the questions from the audience. So uh, thank you again. And uh, yeah, help me. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you. Well, this is fun.